Well, welcome again to Flame of Truth. We're glad that you're uh, finding us on the LOBN and all your options of watching television. So I'm Pastor Dan Smith. I work now with the Southeastern California Conference here in Southern California. But every once in a while I come over here to LOBN and just uh, preach again. We're working through a series in Isaiah. So uh, last week we had sort of introductory wrestling with some of the hard issues. And we'll take another crack at it this week with the issue of uh, some of the hard, difficult passages in Isaiah. And how do we reconcile that with a God of grace and love? I've pastored now almost 35 years, and the question never goes away. I can preach about it week after week, and the questions still come. Pastor, why, why does this have to happen? We'll hear a miracle story. The health food store has a rack of all the stories of people who have eaten this diet or drunk this drink, and now, now they're healed. And someone else drinks the same drink and prays the same prayer and doesn't get well. Someone gets a little money in the, cha in the check or some special miracle happens. Someone else prays, and he said, where is it? For years, I pastored a last year at church when students would come over from last year university from Africa, you know, they'll come with somebody who would sponsor them, and that sponsor just doesn't realize how much it's going to cost to pay for a student to come to school here in the States for four years, and something changes and the sponsor stops. And they come to me and they say, Pastor, can the, can the church help? I, I don't have it. And we pray together. Sometimes it works out, sometimes they struggle and suffer. How do we balance all that out? If God has all these resources and has all this power, why doesn't he use it more? Those are the hard questions that people wrestle with. There's a famous story of the genius uh, kidnapped somebody, and he forced that person to drive to three different banks. But at each of the banks, the kidnapper took his own money out of his own account <laughs> three times. We don't want to take money out of our account. We want God to take money out of his account. And so we pray and say, God, you know. But it seems like most of the time we have to solve it ourselves, take money out of our own account. I had two young girls who worked at the uh, campus cleaners that's over on our campus in last year in Riverside. Every time I would come in, they would say, Pastor Dan, can you help us go to school? We don't have enough money. Can you help? How much do you need? 5000 10000 I don't have it. I would pray with them. One day I walked in, and the girl was all excited. She said, you won't believe it, Pastor Dan. I said, what happened? I got some money. I said, what did you do? She and her partner had gone to the Yellow Pages and had called every doctor, every lawyer. They figured maybe they have some money. She said, I called 100 doctors and lawyers asking them to help me with my tuition. And all of a sudden, at 101, I got somebody who said, everybody deserves a chance, come on down, and wrote out $5,000 checks to both of the two girls. But I said to myself, I'm thrilled for her, what about the 100 calls? Why didn't God make a miracle out of the 100 calls? Why does it take 101 calls before God does a miracle? Or how about the other 100 people who call and don't get I get requests every day from all over the world that I cannot satisfy. Where are the miracles for all of them? If God is the bank, why doesn't he come through with more? My sons, when they were little, they, uh, we had cars that were old and breaking down. They said, Dad, let's go buy a new car. I said, we don't have enough money. Go to the bank. No, there's not enough money in the bank. <laughs> Well, I'll go to mom's account. Mom has money in her account. I said, no, mom doesn't have any money either. Well, then let's go home and get some money and put it in the bank. Then we can buy a car. <laughs> they wanted to do it. They're just sure there's money someplace. Mom or dad, the bank, home, somewhere there was money. And we just believe God is the kind of God. He has money. He has a bank. Where is it? We grow up with these children's stories in church where... A lady gathers all the kids around her and she tells a story how she lost her wallet or some other thing, the car keys, and she prayed and looked everywhere. And after she prayed, there it was, right behind, you know, somewhere she hadn't looked yet. But then kids find out that there's a time when you pray 
and you don't find it. And what happens and their expectations and their perceptions of how God is reliable and you can always count on him turn out that maybe you can't trust God to do all that you want him to do. And so we wrestle with these questions. Charles Spurgeon used to tell a story. He went to visit a little old lady, little uh, Hattie Wilcox in London. He's pastoring this huge church. He goes to visit a little lady. She's in the bed, little tiny boarding house room. And uh, he visits with her. It's dark. He looks up on the wall, and here is, here is a glass frame, and here is a letter handwritten. And he begins to read it, and he realizes this, this is something important. He said, Hattie, what is this? Oh, it's a letter from my boss, George. I worked for him all my life. And then he died. That's all I have from him. Hattie, I have to take this down to the bank. I must to take this right now. I'll bring it back. No, no, I don't want to lose it. It's the only gift. Do you know what this says, Hattie? No, I cannot read. He says, I will bring it back. He goes to the bank. He walks into the bank manager and says, what is this? Oh, that's uh, George's will. We wondered what happened to it. And when they read the will, he had given all his fortune to Hattie. Six million pounds hanging on the wall. She's lying there suffering, poor, indigent, sleeping on a little bed in a tiny little dark room with no one to care for her. And six million pounds are hanging on the wall. And we have God hanging on the wall. We have God as our God. We are his people. Where, where is this bank that he should be giving? Six million pounds hanging on the wall. And how do we access it? Someone told me when I was working on this about a movie called The Island. And evidently at this island, everybody there was a clone of somebody real. But they don't know that they are a clone. They don't know that they're not real. They think they're real. And one of them, Lincoln, begins to be friends with a real person named Jordan. And uh, somehow a conversation came up one time, and they talked to, Jordan's talking about God. And Lincoln says, what, what's, what's God? And, God? and Jordan says, well, you know, when you really want something really bad, and you just can hardly wait it, and you want, and you want it so much, and you can close your eyes, and you just wish for it, God is the one who ignores you. God is the one who ignores you when you want something so much. C.S. Lewis Great Christian writer, was an atheist, became a Christian, wrote some of the most powerful apologetic books that anyone has ever read or written about how to have intellectually responsible faith, reasons for your belief. When he got old, he fell in love with a lady named Joy Davidman. It's an American lady, had two sons. They think maybe he married her first of all just to help her be legal to stay in England, but they fell into love and just had this wonderful, magical few years together. She had cancer, and then it went into remission, and they traveled and just had a wonderful time. And then the cancer came back and just suffered and suffered and then died, leaving them with these two boys, all this joy gone. And someone who had written about joy all his life, it was part of his proof and argument for God. We all have a sense of joy. We have a longing for joy. Why would there be such a longing for that kind of deep joy if there was no such thing as joy? It's this argument for God and argument for heaven. And now the joy is gone. And he writes a diary called A Grief Observed. And he says, right when you need God the most, when you don't need him, he seems to be everywhere. But when you do need him, the door is shut and the bolt is double locked and you cannot find God. Where is God when you really want him? A Grief Observed. Took him a while, this giant of faith, to find his way back to a faith in God. Well, we have to look at this today. How does God deal with suffering? We're looking at Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah, for many writers and commentaries, is sort of split into two sections. There's 39 chapters, and then there's from 40 to 66, 27, similar to the Old Testament, New Testament of the Bible. And there are those who think that uh, it had to be two writers, first Isaiah and second Isaiah, because the second Isaiah is 150 years after the first part of Isaiah. And unless you believe in prophecy, you'd have to say, okay, Isaiah's writing about what's already happened. Or you can believe in prophecy and Isaiah's predicting what will happen. The first 39 chapters, Isaiah is talking about what's going to happen to Israel. You better get back to God and repent. 
and come back to what uh, God has called you to be. Or God is going to send Babylon or Assyria and they're going to come and they're going to take, take you into captivity. And then from 40 on, yes, they're going to be captivity, but God's going to bring you back. So we have this wrestling in Isaiah between these two sides of God. This God who seems to be punishing, a God who doesn't seem to be responding when they're crying out for relief from their enemies and relief from suffering. Where is God? We have these two sides. In Isaiah 40, verse 1, we have this verse that says, Comfort, comfort ye my people, says you are God. So here in Isaiah 40, it says, I am your God and you are my people. There I have a covenant. But then you go and look in Hosea chapter 1, verse 9. You are not my people, and I am not your God. The covenant has been broken. I watched a movie the other night about the covenant as the Jews are in, in uh, Auschwitz. It's days or weeks before they are going to die. And people have been dying all along, and they're wondering when their day will come, all in their green striped uh, prison uniforms. Powerful movie. Just happened to click on it late at night one night. And they have a courtroom trial in that, in that uh, prison barracks in Auschwitz. All these Jews with a couple others mixed in. And they have a trial, and they put God on trial. And the question is, has God broken the covenant? Has God broken the covenant, or had the people broken the covenant? And they debate it, wrestling with these issues. But it looked to Israel as if God had broken the covenant. God is saying, I've had it with you. I've been your people, done everything for you, and yet you reject me. And look at how you're loving. So I'm going to break the covenant. No more am I going to protect you and bless you. I'm not your God, and you are not my people. It's going to be a divorce. But then in chapter 40, he says, but I'll, I'll take you back someday. I'll bring you back. I'll take you back. There's going to be a divorce, and then there's going to be a reconciliation somewhere down the line. After 150 years, Isaiah 40, verse 9, Shout, lift it up. Do not be afraid. Here is your God. Someday the covenant will be restored. When I first preached this in my church, I, had, uh, I talked about two boxes I have in my house. I have a box for a long time. I couldn't even keep it in my house. I kept it in my parents' house. And my father died, and my mother went into a smaller place, and I brought it back. But it's way in the rafters. I haven't looked at it. I went through a divorce 26 years ago. Young pastor just uh, came home from a class and she was gone. Left me, left God, left church, left everything. How much I was responsible for, I have no way of knowing. But I got, I kept a little box. The first letter, I'm, I've left house. Little other things, mementos, cards and notes. And then finally, there's a divorce decree. I was washing the dishes in my house in Grants Pass, Oregon, when all of a sudden a uh, sheriff came up. I knew it was coming sometime, didn't know when. I just accepted whatever she wrote up. It didn't cost me anything to fight lawyers or anything else. Not much to fight over. We had no children. And a sheriff walked up and handed me a divorce decree. I showed it to a lawyer friend of mine, and then we put it in the box. Then came the day when the divorce was final. And I didn't want to be home, didn't want to be there, and so I drove all the way down to where my parents were, down at Pacific Union College in California. I'd gone to school. Where 10 years before, I had dated her and asked her to marry me in the wedding, 21 years old. And now I'm single, divorced. And I met my parents at a movie. They were watching Gandhi when it first came out. They were in the big gymnasium at the college I'd grown up in. And here were 2,000 people all in the dark, couples and families and people. And here I am, surrounded by people, never felt more alone in my life, could not find my parents in all the darkness. Divorce, alone. That's one box. Feel it all again just to tell you the story. But I have another box. <laughs> I have the mementos when I began to fall in love with Hilda, who I'm married to today. Went through three or four years of being alone. We began to date, I collected things. 
Went to a spaghetti factory. I kept the menu. We went here. I kept different programs of the programs we went to, plays we went to, concerts we went to, sports events we went to, notes and cards and phone bills where I called $300 worth in one month 20-some years ago. And then finally we have wedding and anniversaries. 22 years now we've been together. Divorce. And then when God gave me a chance to love again, I will take you back. God says, yes, there's going to be a divorce. There's going to be a breaking of the covenant. But I will not forget you. I will give you love again. I will come and love you, and you will be my people, and I will be your God again. Isaiah 40, verse 2. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Double. Jerusalem stands for all of Israel. After these 39 chapters that are, you know, a little difficult. Some of these passages are hard to read where God is saying, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and his heart is broken and I'm going to bring in Babylon and they're going to take you away. And then finally we have these promises. I'm going to bring you back because Jerusalem, Israel, has, has paid double. So there are two different ways of looking at this verse. Some people would interpret it as they had to go double. The 70 years in captivity were so difficult and so painful, it didn't seem like it was fair. It was double punishment for all our sins. There's another uh, option, though. One book says they used to post the sins of people, and then when someone had paid the price for their sins, they would... They would take that sheet and they would double it up and nail it to say, this is done. And so you could also say this is forgiveness, is that now God has forgiven your sins and forgiven you double, it's doubled up, and God has given you double grace for all of our sins. You can interpret it either way. And then we have Isaiah 40, verse 9. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain, lift up your voice with a shout. In the New Testament, we would call this the gospel. This is good news. I was in college, old good news, bad news jokes. Our teacher walked into class one time and he says, uh, the man came to the uh, Roman galley ships one day down to the slaves rowing the ship and he said, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is the captain has decreed that we will have dessert for lunch. Everyone cheered. The bad news is <laughs> after lunch, the captain wants to go water skiing. <laughs> good news and bad news. But here in Isaiah, after all this, some of this difficult news of what was going to be the consequences of their choices and actions, now there's going to be good tidings. I'm going to bring you back, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. Speak tenderly and bring good tidings. So it's not going to be forever. The suffering is not going to be forever. You may be suffering today, but it's not going to last. Someday God's going to bring you back. We wrestle with the issue of consequences. Were the consequences that uh, Israel went through, were these natural consequences? Do you smoke, you get cancer? Or are these retributive punishment? God punishing Israel. Many of the examples in the Bible are natural consequences. This is just what's going to happen. A man reaps what he sows, Galatians 6 says. If you don't stay close to God, Stay connected to God. God is a source of life in the universe. Then you will surely die. Not because God punishes you, but because you have disconnected yourself from God. But there are a few instances that it's hard to understand where God does Lot's wife turns into salt or Uzzah dies. It does not seem natural. The flood, seven last plagues at the end of the world. And so uh, it seems to me that while most of the consequences in the universe are natural and God wants us to understand the laws of cause and effect, there are certain times when God didn't know what else to do. He wanted people to learn from natural consequences, but there was going to be so catastrophic that God says, let me once in a while show you unnatural consequence, hoping you will learn from the unnatural consequence and you will go back and learn the natural consequences of evil, sin, and the natural consequence of choosing to live with me. And so at certain pivotal defining moments, like Lot's wife, in some of these times, God would have to do some unnatural things. 
Assyria. 185,000 people are killed. How do we understand a God of love killing 185,000 people? You look at the story. These Assyrian generals are mocking God. Forget about your God. He will not come through for you. He is not there. He is no good. God's not going to do this. Where is your God? Nobody else gods have been able to stop us. Neither will, your, neither will yours. And God just cannot let this pass, this sort of defiance against God. And God says, okay, let me draw a line. Let me make clear that there is a God, and I will stand for my people, and there will be consequences. And he steps in with unnatural consequence, just once in a while, with heartbreaking, hoping that we will understand and extrapolate back to natural consequence. We all do it. I tell my little boys when they were little, don't go into the street or I will spank you. And I use the threat of unnatural consequence, hoping that they will eventually learn natural consequence is that if you step into a street, cars can hurt you. It's what we do. And that's what God did. Jump down to Isaiah 40, verse 31. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. We've talked many times about this. You know, there are eagles and there's chickens and there's pigeons. It may not be the greatest way to understand all human beings. It's just a metaphor trying to understand is that there have been people at different stages of their spiritual life, whatever way you want to do it, just stage models, Piaget, Erickson, any of them. And God has to speak differently and relate differently, sometimes at different stages. Not everyone is a spiritual eagle all the time. Sometimes we're, we're pigeons and chickens. And God has to speak to us in language and in actions that will make sense to us. But eventually, it says, he wants to relate to us like eagles. It was a blessing to me. I had to take my son to the Philippines last year. 17 now, 16 then. Didn't have to talk to him about homework or keeping his room clean or anything else. We could just be together like eagles. And that's the way God wants to relate to us, like eagles. No more pigeons and chickens. He says, I want to talk to you like this. Someday we can soar like eagles. But for a while he had to say, I'm going to have to talk to you this way through Babylonians and Assyrians coming to give you captivity. 150 years, interesting. If we understand this passage to be prophecy, God was saying, yes, you're going to go into captivity, and this is going to suffer. You're going to suffer. And it's going to be maybe a long time, 150 years. But do not be afraid. Someday, it may look as if God has forgotten his promises and broken his covenant, but someday God is going to come again and he will be your God and you will be his people. Are you, do you have the kind of faith that can withstand 150 years if your house burns down or you lose your job or you have cancer or some other trouble or the first sign of trouble, okay, that's it. God isn't coming through, gone. Or can you be like the true Israelites who said, it doesn't look good right now, but we believe in God's promise and he will come through and he will be there. For 150 years, they had to hold on. Can you hold on? Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. It may look as if the grass is withering and all that. It may look as if God is not active for us. But the word of God has said he will come back and he will be your God again. Will you hold on to God's word for 150 years, no matter what happens? Now we have to wrestle with this. How does God relate to us? These wonderful promises. Isaiah 40, verse 28, The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. And they will walk and not be faint. It seems to work all the time. How can we understand I think we all understand that God doesn't raise many back from the dead. I had to bury someone with liver cancer the other day. God doesn't seem to heal too many with that. If we would draw a bell curve chart or some kind of a chart, how many times God heals. Some diseases seem to have more. Some diseases we win a lot. When someone needs money, we have many stories where God has sent money. And we have even more stories where someone was this kind of a person, evil, angry, grumpy, fighting, and then they come to Christ and God transforms them and they become like Christ and godly and wonderful husbands and wives and kids and people. 
and they are changed because of Christ. What do we learn about how God works with our world? One writer suggests that there is, I think Haddon Robinson, at one level there is divine intervention, direct intervention. This is what we wish God would do every time, where God just steps in and ax heads float to the top of the water and red seas open and walls come tumbling down. It's obviously God and God just steps in. Not all the time. We wish it was more, but once in a while. Jesus heals a blind man. There's no mud. There's no... He just direct intervention. Other time, there seems to be interaction where God's involved, but he uses some natural human parts of it. God comes to Moses, but in a burning bush. He opens up the Red Sea, but he uses a wind. He heals people in the hospital, but he uses also doctors and protocols and surgeries. He needs to send money to somebody, but he does it through people. And I have mission projects all over the world. God is doing it. God is involved. But it's with interaction. We do it together to answer people's prayers. And sometimes that's how God chooses. Other times, it's not direct intervention. It's not interaction. It's inner action. It's on the inside within. God doesn't do a direct miracle like we wish he would do. He doesn't even work with medicine or with money to take it away. He comes in and he pours grace into our lives and he allows us to somehow sustain, be sustained through whatever suffering we're going through. I don't know what you're going through today. I just want to say God will work one of those ways. His promise is sure. Sometimes direct intervention. Sometimes with interaction. Sometimes it's inner action inside your soul. And that's why he says in this phrase, God will work in you in one way or the other. God will not lie to you. Sometimes we will soar with eagles. Sometimes we will run and not be weary. Other times we will just barely be able to walk. But we will still have God in our lives. That's what God is all about. But you can soar with the eagles. God bless you all.